Agency's 2122 Biennial Report for the Syringe Services Program and adopt the recommendations from the Syringe Services Advisory Commission as outlined in the memo. For the Director of Health Services, we have an agenda for a memo and the biannual report. And here for presentation, we have uh, Monica Morales, our Director of our Health Services Agency, Dr. Gail Newell, our County Health Officer, and Emily Chung, our Director of Public Health. Um, who's starting us off, Dr. Morales? Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Morning. For, the, for the record, Monica Morales, Health Services Agency Director. Okay. Monica, if you could just check your microphone, make sure it's working. on. It, the little green light's on. Let's see. Hello. <laughs> Maybe I should project a little bit more. Does that there help? Is, Thank you. There we go. <clears throat> Clear my throat. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having us here today. I'm here with my colleagues, Health Officer Dr. Newell and Public Health Director Emily Chow. We're here to present to you three components of our uh, syringe services program that you're very familiar with. Um, we do have a mandated report that will highlight some key indicators by our health officer. Um, and also then touch a little bit on the summary biannual report uh, that you have in your packet pertaining to our SSP program. Um, what we're noticing too is that you'll hear some of the key indicators that Dr. Newell will be highlighting for you in terms of increases, unfortunately, in some of our you know, HIV or hep C, for example, indicators and the need really to continue our work pertaining to our syringe services program. We also want to highlight for you the recommendation by our SSP advisory committee to really consider a mobile pilot program. Um, this aligns with your recommendation that you provided to staff in August to basically explore an off-site um, from our MLine campus. And so today, um, you know, I just want to pass it and thank our staff for their hard work in putting this report together for you and consideration of the recommendations from our SSP advisory. With that, I'll just transition it now to Emily so she can give you guys and Dr. Newell uh, the rundown on the data. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Others in the room. Um, I appreciate your patience with my voice. There we go. Uh, that's better too. I'm on the tail end of a respiratory virus here and I uh, have a bad laryngitis. So I've been saving my voice for you. Uh, I'd like to very briefly give you an overview of the state of the health of Santa Cruz County before we dive into the bloodborne pathogens. Um, we're so lucky to live and work and play in this beautiful county where we have uh, so many recreational opportunities, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, lots of opportunities to live healthy lives. Earlier in the month, the annual national county health rankings were released and I'm proud to report that we rank number nine out of 58 counties in the state of California. Nationally, we're among the top 20%. And um, when you look at both the health uh, outcomes like length of life, as well as health opportunities like access to fresh fruits and vegetables, um, we rank um, in the top quarter of the state and as well as the nation. Um, I do want to take this opportunity as well to thank the community and all of you for your support during the last three plus years of the COVID pandemic and report that we have one of the nation's best mortality rates in, uh, in terms of COVID. When you look at COVID deaths per 100,000 people um, and we rank very high in the state tied for tops with San Mateo. So um, better than San Francisco, better than many other places that have been lauded for their COVID response. Um, less than one third of the COVID deaths nationally and less than half of the COVID deaths in the state. So our community came together to do this. Your leadership played a big important part in that. Um, and we can save lives in other ways, not just COVID in this community. When we look at the county health rankings, there are several areas in which we stand out in a negative way. And I was surprised to see some of these. And many of them are around substance use. And um, so we need to think about that as the context for this presentation today. One of the ways we stand out is housing. I don't think any of us are surprised about that. And uh, lack of housing leads to crowded housing, which has left 
less healthy, and homelessness, which we are all aware of in this community and contributes to the problems we're talking about today. Another concerning area is that um, we have more folks in our county reporting, self-reporting severe mental health issues. Um, and then we have um, more excessive drinking of alcohol um, and also more alcohol-related uh, uh, traffic accident deaths. We also have a higher tobacco use uh, in this county, which I was surprised to see higher than the state, um, not higher than the nation, but significantly higher than the state average. And of course, as we all know, we have a higher opioid overdose death rate than the state, um, significantly so. So um, next slide. Oh, that's me. Um, my mandate to you today is to talk about the bloodborne pathogens associated with uh, intravenous drug use. And um, that crosses a number of different categories of conditions that are required to be reported to the public health department. Um, a really important component of this slide got uh, reduced in size, but I want you and the public to know, um, those, there's another slide later on, but um, all of this data is accessible to the public and all of our Title 17 reportable conditions every quarter updated from the state of California at www.datashare.scc for Santa Cruz County, so datashare.scc.org. Congenital syphilis is one of the canaries in the coal mine in the bloodborne pathogens. Um, congenital syphilis means a baby is born with syphilis. So they got it from their mother who got it from someone else during or before their pregnancy. And congenital syphilis, it's a tragedy. Each case costs over a million dollars in governmental funds. And most of the conditions caused by congenital syphilis are not treatable. We've had increasing cases of congenital syphilis, although just a handful each year in Santa Cruz County, fortunately. Most of our cases have been in persons experiencing homelessness, persons with mental illness, persons with addiction, people who did not access prenatal care for a variety of reasons. You can see here the market increase in congenital syphilis between 2011 and 2020. Locally here, when we look at syphilis compared to other sexually transmitted disease, we see both county and state rates that for the most part, the other sexually transmitted illnesses, chlamydia and gonorrhea, did not increase significantly over the past 10 years. However, syphilis has been rising significantly, especially in our male population. And partly this is because syphilis is a bloodborne illness. So you don't get it only through sex, but also through sharing needles and other bloodborne uh, routes. When you look specifically at our risk factors for syphilis in Santa Cruz County in the last two years, these are predictable as in terms of our same population that uses needles, our same population that reports severe mental illness. These are our syphilis risk factors, having been incarcerated ever, meth use within the past year, using internet for seeking sex services, persons experiencing homelessness, and intravenous drug use in the past year. Our HIV rates have been rising as well, although the trend is slow and uh, perhaps not yet significant. Um, this is uh, remarkable in our county and that statewide we're not seeing the same kind of increase, but in Santa Cruz County we are. Hepatitis C, on the other hand, is fantastic news. We've seen an 86% decrease in the last four years. That's because we can now treat hepatitis C. So there's much less of it circulating in our community than there has been in the past. Again, a reminder about data share that all of the 
Data I'm sharing today can be found at www.datashareSCC.org. This looks like good news. This is a trend of opioid prescriptions um, in Santa Cruz County since 2009. And you see this sharp trend downward um, or a definitive trend downward as physicians and other healthcare providers are prescribing fewer opioids. You see the big surge at the beginning, thanks to big pharma. And um, then we see this downward trend to very low prescription rates. The bad news about this, however, is that we as a medical profession and a healthcare system, we're not ready to meet the needs of the population no longer getting their opioid prescriptions. As a result, many of these people turn to the street to illegal substances to meet their addiction needs. The medical community was not there for them. And uh, as we improve our, our medication-assisted treatment services, and as we increase our wraparound services in our syringe services program and throughout the community, we continue to see startling opioid trends. These are numbers from our county coroner. These are the number of deaths and from what cause. And what you see is a stark decline in heroin, even from last year to this year. And my understanding is it's almost impossible to get heroin on the street now that what is on the street, the only option is fentanyl. And as a result, our opioid addicts need more opioids. They're harder to treat and much more likely to die of overdose. So um, just a, a brief uh, breakdown by zip codes. I think it's easier to see on this map. And uh, this is the opioid-related overdose deaths by zip code, by area of our county. And um, it's no um, coincidence that this correlates very strongly with opioid prescriptions written over the past 10 years. These are the neighborhoods, the areas where the most opioid prescriptions were written, leaving these areas most vulnerable. I'm going to turn it over now to Public Health Director Emily Chung for uh, details about what we're doing in the county's syringe services program. Thank you so much, Dr. Noel, for that report. That's a really great basis for the update around our county syringe services program. So Emily Chung, Public Health Director, thank you so much for the time this morning. Just, uh, I'll start with sharing a little bit about what our syringe services program is set out to do. It is a harm reduction program to, um, to prevent infectious diseases. We have a three-pronged approach that drives our work, starting with syringe distribution to prevent spread of disease. We exchange clean needles with used needles, and typically, actually, we exchange we get uh, we give out more clean needles than we receive in terms of of um, used needles in our exchange sites. We use evidence-based practices to ensure we provide the best services in this anonymous program. Our syringe collection helps improve the public's health overall with safe disposal of used syringes. We work to reduce the impacts of syringe waste by managing seven public kiosks for disposal of syringe litter, as well as funding, training, and providing technical assistance to two local nonprofits that provide syringe litter collection um, services for us in the community. Finally, we provide enhanced linkage and referrals to improve participants' health and well-being. We are a client-centered program, and so these types of services to help um, access drug treatment services, medical services, mental health, and um, infectious disease testing all help promote a, a well-being of our participants. Um, we also distribute tools uh, for harm reduction like naloxone, also known as Narcan, safer smoking kits, and fentanyl test strips, which help reduce the impacts of opioid overdose and death in our community. 
The Viena report, which is in your packet, covers a two-year comprehensive set of information. So I want to thank our program staff and our population health unit for putting together this excellent report. In the report, the high-level trends that I will highlight include a decline in county exchange participation and encounters. So fewer participants participants and unique visits are, have, a, have been the trend the last two years. We are seeing decline in the syringes dispenses and collected from county exchange sites compared to pre previous years. However, we are seeing an increase in the use of the community public kiosk for disposal of syringes. I'll share some additional data on that um, next. We're also seeing an increase in distribution of harm reduction items such as Narcan, safer smoking test kits, um, sorry, sorry, safer smoking kits and fentanyl test strips. For instance, during our reporting period of 21-22, we dispensed over 4,000 naloxone uh, kits to program participants and partner organizations. From our participants surveyed, we found that exchanges have helped support naloxone and save and saving lives over 300 times with those naloxone kits. To emphasize the trends, this table, um, this gra uh, graph shows us the trends from 2019 through 2022. Uh, at the, in, 20, in 2019, you see the percentage of needles only was nearly 100% of the reason why clients were coming into our county syringe services program. By 2022, we are seeing a, a trend that shifts to where uh, individuals are coming for both needles and for safer smoking kits. So this is a potential uh, suggestion that there's a shift in modality of drug use among our syringe services exchange participants. This slide here provides a visual and information about when we installed our community syringe waste kiosk throughout the county. We currently have five kiosks in the city of Santa Cruz and two in the city of Watsonville. We are in negotiations now for two additional syringe kiosks to be installed in, uh, in our communities. And that will be, uh, we'll be able to announce that hopefully soon. Um, these seven kiosks have helped increase the uh, utilization of our of these public syringe litter sites um, or uh, kiosks. And in the last two years, in 21-22, the kiosks have collected an estimate of 1.2 million syringes. And that is an estimate based on weight. Our exchange sites have collected over 350,000 needles during that same time period. If you would like to see additional data on the waste that we collect um, of syringes, you can find that in the biennial report on page 29, 21 of the report, as well as appendix documents. The final component of today's presentation is regarding the board director from August 2022 asking our syringe services advisory commission to look at the possibility of moving our North County syringe site out of the Emmeline campus and look at other possible locations like the Coral Street um, location or other um, mobile options. We are here to report that the syringe services program advisory commission has uh, worked with our program staff and has provided the following recommendation. Uh, the recommendation is to pilot a hybrid model which will reduce exchange services at our fixed site locations and then use those hours to provide exchange services at outreach in collaboration with the Homeless, per homeless, homeless Persons Health Program um, through HSA. This would, um, the recommendation also includes uh, a recommendation to remove the a certain object um, operational directives from the board, such as the fixed location and fixed hours, um, which will allow us more flexibility and uh, flexibility and ability to adjust to the community's needs. Currently, we operate the fixed sites seven hours at Watsonville and twelve hours at Emmeline each week. The Syringe Services Program uh, Advisory Commission has been very helpful and thoughtful, and I want to thank them for their time in providing these recommendations. 
what the advisory commission found to be the strengths of this hybrid model, as we are calling it, it will allow us to reach people where they are at um, in that client-centered way. Our fixed site participants, uh, many of our participants prefer the fixed site given its confidentiality and its location that is regular and routine for them. Um, and only half of our participants are persons experiencing homelessness. So this, these fixed sites allow um, a more diverse community to use the uh, syringe services program. We, by going mobile in this hybrid model, we can reach new participants that we are currently not already serving and meeting them where they're at to bring them safe disposal, safe disposal of syringes and provide them clean syringe, syringes as well as harm reduction tools and linkages to services. This will also give us a stronger opportunity to collaborate with the community and flex to responding to changing community needs without having to actually expand. We will pair with established partners such as HPHP, Street Medicine, to provide the medical wound care and referrals into their medical assistant treatment. And we can work with our neighborhood partners to enhance relationships to test and learn whether this will address the neighborhood impacts to syringe service programs. This table shows um, the resources that will be shifted during the hybrid model pilot if approved. Um, you'll notice that it is a cost neutral impact because we are shifting hours from the current SSP model of fixed site um, staffing over into the outreach with HPHP. Um, and it typically actually use, we anticipate using less staff actually in an outreach model because we'll be leveraging existing resources with HPHP. And um, if approved, we would anticipate beginning this hybrid model as soon as May in terms of planning and updating policies, procedures, and engaging with our community for um, to understand how this will be best rolled out. We would transition in August, um, operating the uh, existing hours and outreach simultaneously for a month until we can fully implement starting September, where we would remove the, uh, the two shifts for at the fixed sites in order to, um, to offset the outreach. And then we would analyze the impacts beginning October through November to in that first quarter as we uh, test and learn and make some uh, adjustments. So as a reminder, this, uh, this does not in, uh, suggest any increase in hours. It's really a shift of hours. And uh, we would find a, a, this to be cost neutral financial impact where we would not be requesting any vehicles or additional supplies or additional staff during this pilot. Uh, current supplies would be um, sufficient to allow us to do this outreach uh, option. So in summary, our recommended actions, we respectfully ask the board to accept and file our report and to consider adoption of the recommendations from the advisory commission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions from board members, uh, Supervisor Cummings. First, I just wanna appreciate um, all the work that you all have done behind this and appreciate our commissioners who put a lot of time in to come up with um, you know, a pilot project that um, you know, will allow us the opportunity to see how a mobile program could actually um, help us reach more people and um, hopefully reduce more harm in our community. Um, I guess I'm just kind of curious about, uh, I, I started hearing from some folks in the community about the heroin issue and how heroin's pretty much gone and fentanyl's now the new thing. And so I'm just wondering if that's really, I don't really know much about um, fentanyl consumption. So I'm just wondering if that's, you know, the, the fact that we're seeing the needles um, requests go down. Is that because fentanyl can be, I mean, I know it can be consumed in different ways, but I'm just wondering if that's kind of contributing to it, that it's not something that people usually use intravenously. And as a, as a result, we're starting to see less needles with the loss of, with heroin now no longer being available. Anecdotally, that's what we're hearing is uh, from our participants is that they're shifting from uh, intravenous use to smoking. That's doesn't necessarily protect them uh, against fatal overdose, um, but it certainly would help with the um, bloodborne pathogens that we talked about today. Um, so uh, that is one factor in the decreasing. Um, certainly the um, ongoing and increasing distribution of syringes by our 
partners, the Health Reduction Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County, is also impacting our um, services. And then I was just um, wondering if you could, I'd never heard of the smoking kits before, so I'm wondering if you could just talk about like what those are and what's distributed. Great question. Um, this, those are new resources we started implementing in 2020, and I actually would like to defer to my program staff if um, I could ask Rashawn to speak about what's in a smoking kit, please. And while Rashawn makes this, essentially what it is, it's basically also a harm reduction model for us for it educates them in terms of if you're going to smoke uh, whatever um, item, product, uh, these are some of the considerations or best ways for you to kind of uh, do the smoking. And I'll pass it out to Rashawn for more information. Uh, good morning. Um, Rashawn Williams, the program coordinator for the Syringe Services Program. And uh, approximately two years ago, we began to uh, distribute uh, smoking kits. Um, it's something that's available through uh, the state clearinghouse, a harm reduction tool. So we did some research, firstly, to get some buy-in from our participants to see if it was something that they were interested in. And uh, we received feedback that, yes, uh, there was interest in smoking kits. Um, so we put together a brochure um, to include in these kits, which includes some of the comparisons, or I should say benefits of smoking versus injecting, which has been pointed out, a reduction in bloodborne pathogens um, spread. Uh, and then also um, a lower risk of overdose, and that was based on uh, resource primarily around um, heroin use, uh, fentanyl, as uh, Dr. Newell has pointed out, there's still, um, of course, a very high risk. Um, I digress. Uh, we also included um, uh, condoms, um, information about uh, our uh, um, health services, and especially the uh, Homeless Persons Health Project, their hours, um, mass services, um, signs of overdose, uh, and other tools to promote health while smoking, including alcohol, um, wipes, um, pipe holders, et cetera. Uh, but it is a harm reduction tool um, to give persons the opportunity to switch modalities and uh, decrease the spread of uh, disease primarily. Great. Matt, I just had one more question, please. Um, I was, so when, when you all go out, and, and this might be linked to what is currently offered at um, the fixed site, but are there opportunities to connect people to different types of county programs, whether it's Medi-Cal, CalFresh, housing, vouchers? I'm just kind of curious what kind of um, opportunities there are to connect people for to more services, and if that's something that's going to be, be um, deployed with these kind of mobile um, services as well. Yes, that would be the intent to increase the uh, enhanced linkages and referrals to services, including um, eligibility enrollment, um, staff dependent on who's there. Pairing with HPHP really does connect many of our health services agencies, best components of clinical services and harm reduction tools. So um, we certainly hope to expand what we can provide in terms of resources. As uh, Mr. Williams shared, um, we provide flyers, information, um, and hopefully can do more warm handoffs in this pilot model with, with the outreach. Great. Well, thank you all for your work. and. Really excited to see, you know, what information we're able to learn from this because, you know, connecting with people where they are also helps to keep um, needle litter from going into our environment. And so um, just want to thank you all for your work on this and look forward to, to seeing how we can support your efforts. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, just two questions. Um, on the maps that you had, the, it looked like the, the, the center's or one on the Freedom Center, right? Where was the other one? It looked like West Beach. Yes. Like that, that it's actually in the, um, what's the name of that? The, sorry, I have it written It looks like the industrial area to me. It is. Oh, it, it is. is. It's the, I want to say it's the waste disposal site in the, Watts, in the Watsonville. Oh, the service center, the yes. city service center. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then uh, just, you know, I, I, it, it, well, I guess that's a good location because there is going to be that collaboration between the city and the counties uh, and Monterey County as well that's close by 
walking distance at first in Riverside. Um, but there's, you can't really walk in those areas either. Yeah. Um, we would love to see additional. The Presbyterian yes. Church. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like literally two blocks away, but mm -hmm. it's not really that walkable in that area. Uh, my other question is, what is that? I noticed most of District 4 is beige, but what's that little pink spot in the middle? Which location is that? On that other map that shows the color coordinated where that most use is at? We can find that out for you. Do, do you know? I see I, it. I put it up really quick, and I was trying Please. to figure out where, where that hot spot was in District 4. We will go back to our population health unit and find out which zip code that is specifically. I oh, it's these all, are... Yeah, it's all 95076, but there's only one little hot spot. We'll the... get the region. Yeah, uh, Supervisor Hernandez. Yeah. yeah. I also just want to highlight that a lot yeah, of the kiosk is. locations uh, are due to our partnerships with the cities. So the more we can partner with the cities to increase some of those locations, the stronger um, I think the kiosk outreach will be as well. So putting a plug in for sure. <laughs> You may be starting to hear about xylazine. Um, Santa Clara County has now um, uh, had several cases of xylazine uh, confiscated. And this just this last week, they had a xylazine overdose death. So that's the first one in California that we know of. Um, and uh, that's an additive uh, also called uh, dope or, or trank dope. It's an, a veterinary medication. And um, it's being used to prolong the effects of the fentanyl. So the drug manufacturers in Mexico, when it's manufactured there, are adding this xylazine. And um, so it is not reversible by Narcan. Um, and it creates terrible skin wounds, um, even if it's smoked. And so um, we're watching for that. It's increasing um, throughout the United States, especially the East Coast. But uh, just for your education information, you'll be hearing more about xylazine. And we, of course, want everyone to continue to use their Narcan, even if they think it might be xylazine, because there's a chance of reversal. Um, never too much Narcan in there, and there's no wrong time to use it. A little unrelated, but do you have any maps of the, of like this or for District 4 for methamphetamine use, like hotspots? There probably are um, maps like that, and I can find that out for you as well. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Supervisor Conan. Thank you, Chair. I want to begin by uh, just appreciating this transition plan that's here before us uh, to a hybrid model and all the work that the Syringe Services Program Advisory Commission did uh, to uh, review the data and formulate this recommendation. Um, and that it's a recommendation that does not add any cost to the program, that uh, will meet people where they're at, as said, and works with uh, our existing healthcare outreach staff and vehicles with the Homeless Persons Health Project, uh, to, um, and, and will really enable a warm handoff between syringe services program um, outreach members and folks with Homeless Persons Health Project. Um, also, I mean, I didn't mention it, but it was in the report that um, actually a large amount of the budget that does come directly from our general fund for this program uh, actually does does uh, a tr go to fund the downtown streets team and to clean neighborhoods most impacted by uh, syringe use uh, or, and, and dr drug use. Um, so I think it's I just want to highlight that because you know we are really making every effort to be responsive to the community's concerns uh, at large as well. Um, for me, the the biggest thing missing here is just um, a couple of things. First of all, the, uh, Supervisor Cummings alluded to this, but the lack of data about handoffs to other services. I know you guys mentioned that you're, you know, it's a, not a, necessarily an easy problem to solve, um, but you know, just, you know, I, I know that syringe services do provide, you know, as you said, essential benefit just in reducing uh, transmission of bloodborne pathogens. But of course, we don't want that to be sort of the end of the road for people accessing these services. Hopefully, um, it's the beginning of a journey to greater health overall. And I mean, in the data we have today, I don't see how, you know, any sense of how successful we are helping people on that journey. And of course, in identifying how we can help people be more successful uh, in, in moving along and accessing other services. So, um, I mean, we can speak to that. You know, where are we as far as measuring uh, those handoffs and, and outcomes? So I'll, I'll um, highlight a little bit. We know that in uh, when folks come into our facility, 
for the drop-in center, we always hand out information to them. It is anonymous, so we can't track if, in fact, that individual, um, you know, if there was a follow-up. Well, we do track that, and we're talking internally, and the program can elaborate a little bit more about bringing some of that information to you guys. We do track it, um, but again, making that link will be statistically for us very difficult to align. However, it, it is being encouraged. It is being the information is being provided by our staff. Um, what I can say also is that we have seen a high increase in MAT services from our clinic and also um, services for uh, our in our other uh, community programs in terms of rehab. So we can present some of that information to you. Obviously, again, mm -hmm. I can't say that it's a correlation, but we are seeing high need um, for some of those services in our community. And I'm not sure if you want to elaborate. It is challenging because of the anonymity of this program to find out if we've closed the loop in terms of referral. Um, our staff continue to survey participants and try to learn if they've actually used the resources that are provided. And um, we have uh, plans to enhance how we uh, understand our referral success if, as we got hybrid and with some future, hopefully, funding opportunities that we're applying for. Yeah, great. It would be helpful to see some of the uh, MAT data side by side. And, you know, maybe also this is a question at the intake for um, medically assisted treatment services is, you know, how did you hear about us? Um, and maybe there's an opportunity to collect some data on that end as well. Um, you know, the other area where I think we're, we're not seeing the whole picture, uh, at least not in this report, uh, is in the work that other folks in this space are doing. I mean, you mentioned the Harm Reduction Coalition, um, which was licensed in 2020 um, and is, is clearly doing, uh, I mean, presumably a lot of the work that um, our own program used to do, right? I mean, we've seen a 70% decrease uh, in, you know, total use of the syringe services program over the past few years. So clearly they've, they're doing a lot. Um, and it's not really evident, um, you know, again, exactly uh, what it, what service they're, I mean, we know what service they're providing, but you know, how our services can intersect, any information they ha um, have around, you know, total syringes distributed, collected, and then uh, linkages with other county services. So um, I, I know there was mention in the report of some collaboration with them uh, in terms of community events. I think that's a, it's a good start. And I think anything we can do uh, to, have more data sharing between our entities would be helpful as well. Yeah, this is something that um, we recognize and want to strengthen our partnership um, with our community partners that are doing similar work or work around this space. So we can come back to the board report on that progress for sure when we uh, present to you on the pilot um, outcomes. Okay, great. And then the last thing I'll mention is um, I mean, with this startling rise uh, of fentanyl use and, and overdose deaths in our community. I mean, I've heard a lot of stories about this impacting, uh, I mean, everyone, including uh, students in our middle and high schools. I mean, it's pretty terrifying. Um, and when you started this presentation, Dr. Newell, by talking about you know, COVID and how we really rallied and, and made incredible gains, had you know some of the best outcomes ultimately in, in the whole state and country. Uh, I'm wondering, when do we really change our messaging around the fentanyl epidemic to be similar to what we did with COVID, right? I mean, that was just a, such a huge uh, public information effort. Um, and it really feels like we need the same kind of effort now around the fentanyl crisis because, you know, I'm concerned that, um, you know, there's, there's students who this is effect, affecting their classmates and maybe they don't even realize that and realize that they're at risk. I mean, we need to encourage parents to have this conversation with their with their children. Um, and ultimately, the more people that know about it, um, the more lives we can save. So I guess, yeah, the question is, where, where are we as far as treating this as really the epidemic that it is? Well, you heard from our partners at SafeRx today. Um, and so they're the collaborators uh, across four counties now, actually, including San, uh, San Luis Obispo as part of our partnership. And uh, we're working together with um, 
law enforcement, the courts, um, the jails, everywhere that's touched by this epidemic. Um, and so that's a great start. Um, Governor Newsom just announced yesterday a big uh, push uh, from law enforcement side to try to really um, blockade these cartels from bringing the supplies in. But the answer here in our community, as well as nationwide, is really the greater context of why is the demand for these substances there? Why is Santa Cruz County um, using substances of all kinds at a higher rate? Um, what can we do to build resilience in our community um, and better mental health without the use of substances? I think that's that's the biggest question. I also want to add um, uh, the scale of the problem is so significant, and I think the resources allocated to it on the prevention side are very minor compared to the issue. So there's definitely more education we can be doing. Um, I mean, with COVID, we saw literally billions of dollars come our way to address the issue. And with the prevention pieces, we're very, uh, we are under-resourced. Um, and so I think it's going to take a comprehensive approach obviously a policy approach, what are we doing as a county to um, basically reduce policies or increase policies um, to really combat this issue as well as education and outreach in the schools um, and to parents. Parents play a key component or caregivers on education as well. So, you know, I, I think we're all very familiar with the practices. It's just the capacity uh, from, from the perspective of programming uh, can be elevated for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that there's certainly a resource differential. We had a lot more re resources available when it came to tracking the COVID uh, pandemic and, than we do for tracking the, the fentanyl one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think just the more we can, uh, you, you know, real, almost have real-time reporting of, of new fentanyl-related deaths. I mean, the way we did during the COVID epidemic, it seemed like, you know, you'd, you'd got, we got a news article every time you know, someone passed away in our emergency room as a result of COVID. And I mean, even just the data that was shared today um, around fentanyl deaths, I think what it was 41 in last year, 39 this year. Uh, I think that 39 number actually doesn't include all of last year, right? I mean, yeah, I was saying, the 22 numbers are only through September. Exactly. So what is the, you know, here we are like six months later. Um, it would be great to understand what well, well, did 2022 end up surpassing 2021 you know we, we we i think we just need to keep sharing this data up-to-date data so that it does break through people's consciousness and real and, and help people realize this is something that's happening now right this month this week um so anything we can do to uh, accomplish that would be much appreciated thank you supervisor mcpherson yeah, I want to thank the health services staff, uh, both past and present, for uh, as well as you know our commission uh, that um, and the community members for addressing this issue. Um, you know, we've there's been an enormous amount of work on policy uh, work that we've collectively done in this program over the past decade, especially in the last five years. And I uh, I've sh we've shared the collective goal of providing a harm reduction in our community and trying to also address the concerns about how the SSP program fits into a broader community desire uh, to see a reduction in drug addiction. Um, my hope is to bolster our county program that we have as in some ways that have been mentioned uh, as much as possible while we're reducing the impacts um, uh, for the community at large. Um, I've really appreciated the county leadership in this, as we have done. Um, there are some good positives. We have some real big concerns that we have to address, as we know. Um, I also appreciate the recommended actions today to support the hybrid service model. I think that's a, a great model that supports the uh, increased mobile response that many, many people in our community had suggested. Um, I think this pilot per, uh, period is going to help us um, determine the level and type of services we, we need to meet our community's needs itself. Um, and I can, but I'm con uh, continue to be concerned about the drop in use of our county SSP um, as evidenced by the sharp decline in visits and the unique ID clients, which creates some issues itself and uh, lack of cumulative data uh, regarding improperly discarded syringes. Um, 
I know staff has had difficulty in collecting the data from other agencies and partners, but I think it's important to our community to know that um, we understand the magnitude of this issue. It's upon us. I think we're addressing it. And I want to thank especially uh, agencies like our downtown streets team that's helped us in this area. Um, I, I do have some additional questions, uh, comments before I would like to make a motion on um, when appropriate, but uh, I'll wait to hear some community comments first. And um, thank you for your efforts and following our direction that we, we, uh, we issued not so long ago. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Um, this is a public health crisis, and it needs to be viewed in the same way as other large public health crises we've had in our community and in our country. Uh, the data is stark and sobering. And clearly, while we're doing a lot, we're not doing enough, or we're not doing enough of the right things. And so to come in with a modification is not just appropriate, it's needed right now. So I'm supportive of the recommended actions as they are, and I look forward to that item when it comes back uh, for the board for action. I'd like to open it up for the community on this item. Is there anybody in chambers that would like to address us on this item? Good morning, still. James Young Whitman. I reshared an article that came up two years ago on the 20th of April, and I went to try to find it to find some particular information, but Facebook's already erased it. It had to do with um, a young mother picking up a uh, dollar bill on the ground, and because of the fentanyl on it, she had an extreme reaction just touching that substance. So this is really a great time to, you know, give an example of wagging the dog. I don't remember the physician's name who in 1996 uh, wrote a book called The Medical Mafia, where she described western medicine as uh, petrochemical finance sickness over health profits over cures she she asked her patients a lot of questions one of the questions was what presented what percentage of you trust your doctors and it was 76 percent what percentage of you trust your politicians and it was six percent now with the lobbyists and what's going on it's the politicians that are actually controlling the medical professionals so i admit that i missed i came in late at about 10:30. I didn't hear this whole thing, but um, some of the quotes I took down, I don't really have time to uh, share. I wish I did, but um, people are making comparisons between this ep epidemic and COVID, and um, there's a lot of things that are synthetic that are really damaging people. Um, you thought that heroin addiction was bad enough. I don't know how much more toxic fentanyl is. I I don't remember. I think it's, I just don't know. I think it's more than a factor of 50. So it's, you know, I could, I really have a lot of compassion for you guys. You're in such a state of fear about doing what's right. I'm here for another item and I'll speak on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers that would like to address this on this item? Ma'am, you I believe you already actually addressed this on this item, correct? When you spoke during oral communications this morning. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's fine. I, I can send an email. Thank you. Thank you so much. I apologize to do that, but that's that was the opportunity. Anybody else? Thank you. Good morning. Hi, good, mo good morning. Uh, my name is Socorro Gutierrez. Excuse me. <clears throat> I think I have your laryngitis. Just kidding. Um, and I am the health services manager over Care Team Integrated Services, of which the syringe services program is part of. I just wanted to address a couple of things. One is... Um, uh, Supervisor Koenig, you mentioned um, the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County. So I just wanted to highlight that they are a partner. Um, Rashawn Williams, our program coordinator, does a great job at, you know, communicating about ensuring we're not um, duplicating services. Um, also about our operations and how can how we can better leverage our resources. Um, also, um, you know. As a staff and team of two, um, we've also been looking for funding opportunities, one of which will be coming next month to, to the board about a funding opportunity that is specifically around working in our SSPs to improve referrals and linkages to MAT. Um, so we'll be able to hopefully hire some extra help staff to be able to actually track you know, move from an anonymous program to uh, somebody, you know, to a confidential, meaning they're able to um, uh, be linked to a navigator 
to uh, complete their services uh, and link to uh, map navigation services. So we're doing a lot of incredible work. Um, definitely having a program coordinator for the last two years has um, not only improved um, the level of services that we're providing to our participants, but we've gone a long way around our partnerships um, with the, all the cities. So I, I just want to uh, highlight that for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Serena, your microphone is now available. Hi, thank you. Good morning. My name is Serena King, and I'm one of the commissioners of the Syringe Services Advisory Commission. And I wanted to thank the staff, uh, specifically Rashawn and Sokoto, for their work that they've done in putting together um, best, best practices and recommendations on how to move forward. And I really want to encourage the board to adopt the recommendations that were brought forward today. Um, the pilot model they put together seems like it'll work well for everyone and it's really low risk to start with. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Newell and Emily Chung for their attendance at our SSP advisory meet meetings and their support for the work. Um, and finally, I want to encourage the board to fill the open spots on the advisory commission. Currently, there are four commissioners out of seven available spots. And I think it would be really helpful and nice to have some more diverse representation on the advisory commission. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention around um, the comment about harm reduction coalition and reviewing their numbers and understanding their work. We did at our last commission meeting, Chair Bruder brought Harm Reduction Coalition's uh, last annual report and we reviewed all their numbers in detail and did do a comparison. So that work is being done and I believe it should be in our um, minutes from our last meeting if you're interested in seeing that. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else online? Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. I'm Garrett, and I'd like to thank James for his comments. The companies that are gave us this opioid crisis are Pfizer, Glaxo, Sanofi, and Merck. I'd like to see these corporations prohibited from doing the harm they're doing. And these are the four companies that make all of the U.S. vaccines for the children's program. You referred to COVID deaths. There have been many deaths from the COVID shots as reported to theirs. The figure is that there have been more adverse reactions and deaths mm -hmm. from the COVID shots than from all the other vaccines combined over the years. That's a, a horrific figure. I'm referring also to a, dog, a paper, COVID shots for adults and children. What we know now, this is from westernaprice.org. I suggest Gail Newell that you study this. In addition, you're talking about, um, let's see where I think I just lost the page here. Um, here, we don't have the whole picture. Here's an overview. This is from Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s book, The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health. The lockdown caused so many of these problems. The Thank lockdown. you, Ms. Garrett. Thank you. And, and just as a reminder, this item is regarding certain services. Is there anybody else online that would like to comment on the item before us? I don't believe so, Chair. All right. I think we have one more person in chambers. Hi, good morning. My name is Leslie Goodfriend. I am a community member, retired County Health Services uh, Senior Manager. Um, I'm speaking in support of this um, 
And sitting here today, I'm remembering back to probably 15 to 20 years ago when our needle exchange program was providing this service out in the community. And it makes my heart warm to hear that we're going back to that public health model that serves people where they live, where they engage whatever practice they are. And that is a client-centered approach. So I appreciate that. Back uh, in the early days, the health services agency operated um, a drop-in center on Front Street that was a partnership with Santa Cruz AIDS Project and the then needle exchange program, was, which was its own entity. And by a collaborative partnership approach, we were able to serve people who are at high risk for HIV and hepatitis C. Um, that drop-in center provided an amazing service to help people get off the street and get the care they needed, including referrals to other other services. We know that that takes a long time and it, it's about developing relationships. So I'm really, really glad that we're moving back to going out and serving people that need it where they are. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Would you like to address us on this item? Um, yeah, feel free to step forward. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just be brief. Uh, I know that we go over some of this information in our uh, in the report which you have. Um, <clears throat> but speaking of leveraging um, our resources and partnerships, um, and specifically for the uh, Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County, uh, I just wanted to point out that um, for our program, we do, in fact, collect more syringes at our exchange than we distribute. We have a one-for-one -one model, and uh, in, in doing so, we never go above what people turn in uh, and what we distribute. Um, the Harm Reduction Coalition, on the other hand, does not. They have a, um, an, an as-need uh, practice, which is, which is um, a best practice. Uh, as far as meeting people's needs. Um, and we also utilize our communications with them. So for instance, when the county is closed on holidays, uh, we put up signs referring persons to the Harm Reduction Coalition uh, if they do come by the exchange um, and, and find that we're not there, um, they can connect with them. However, they only operate on, on certain days of the week. Um, so in this hybrid model, uh, we are looking to um, expand our outreach collection and distribution and trying to operate on days when they are not operating um, so that we can um, provide that service uh, to persons who are not able to access syringes um, because of lack of means or, or, or lack of programs uh, where they can receive them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll bring it back to the board for action, Supervisor. Yeah, I might have, I think that's clarified one of the questions I had, if you will. Um, the new mobile outreach will not provide syringe exchange directly, and but rather just testing and referrals. Is that right? And, and if it is right, um, what are the reasons we're not recommending the exchange? So to clarify, this would include exchange of needles in outreach alongside HPHP staff. So a syringe services program staff okay. would accompany our HPHP street medicine during their outreach events as well. And the, S, the syringe services program staff would provide exchange services and um, provide any tools for harm reduction that they would need, whether it's safer smoking kits, Narcan, et cetera and also provide the referrals over to HPHP who are already going to be there for any medical care, wound treatment, um, any testing, um, other services that our, per, our SSP staff don't do. Okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification. And in the Biana report, uh, I think it's on page uh, 46, the number of total syringes that was collected went down while the number collected at kiosks specifically increased. Yes. Um, does that mean we're seeing a drop in the number of syringes collected or at the fixed exchange rate or exchanges um, related to the decrease? Correct. So the fixed exchange collection of syringes, the trend is we are collecting fewer needles from the fixed site exchanges, but seeing an increase in the kiosk use for collecting syringe waste. Okay, thank you, thank you. Do you have a motion, sir? Yeah, I, I, did you, I'd like to make a motion, but go ahead. Oh, I got a question. So with the mobile response, it, 
where it's it's fixed right now at the MSC Center. So afterwards, it can be moved from like the roadway in case we do get the the grant applicant awarded for the roadway in and at the Presbyterian Church where we're doing the work there. So the, in theory, yes. So we okay. would um, at each of the fixed locations. So we have one in Watsonville, one in Emmeline. We would uh, remove the shift that has the fewest participants um, based on averages. And so that would be a two hour shift we would reduce. Those hours and staff would then be used for outreach in the community and they would um, shift and move depending on where the need is. So if the need would be at the Presbyterian Church or Roadway Inn, our staff would consider that and work with HPHP on um, shifting and moving at where the participants could be. Vice Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, um, I'd like to make a recommended action that we um, approve the um, one and two of the staff report, uh, but with some additional direction, if I might. Um, have the HSA, uh, HSA staff uh, come back to the board no later than March 2024, uh, about a year from now, on the status of the 18 month um, hybrid program and provide any resource adjustments needed at the time. Um, also have, uh, and you've been asked to do a lot and you've done a lot, so excuse me, but there's three things. Uh, the second one being have the uh, staff continue working with other jurisdictions, uh, county contractors and community partners to collect data on uh, improperly discarded syringe litter uh, and provide an update on the board by December of uh, this year. And um, have the HSA staff continue to examine alternatives to citing a fixed North County program exclusively in Emmeline, including opportunities to include SSP services and a broader community planning for Coral Street, navigation services, and other homelessness uh, programs. The responses. Second. Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second with some additional direction. Just um, would it be possible, Supervisor McPherson, because you acknowledged the sort of the workload issue that they combine those two reports? You have one coming in December, one coming in March. Can you, yeah. could we do them both in March potentially? So that I, I would uh, defer to them if that's possible. Now, or it, would it be better? I'm sure it would be better if both were in be March. <laughs> <laughs> we are doing a lot of work with our city partners for sure. Um, and I think we just need a little time to do, uh, you know, give you guys a comprehensive update on how those efforts are going. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, the, for the second directive, um, the, the update by March of 24 as well. Okay. Not Thank you. Second. All right. So we have a motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second. I believe Supervisor Cummings beat you out by a tenth of a second. Sorry, you won't get in the minutes. Um, if we could have a, what was the question? Yeah. I was going to add a couple comments. Okay, please. Um, so, well, again, I just want to thank you all for doing hard work on this. Um, Microphone, I think, just. Sorry. Hear me now? All right. So, um, again, wanted to thank you all for bringing this to us. And just a couple comments, um, just based on kind of the conversation we've been having. Um, but for future consideration, um, I think we might want to consider potentially changing the name of this program. It sounds like when it was first created, it was really focused on syringes. And now that's really changed. And so I think in terms of people wanting to go to these programs and, and getting more participation, really trying to frame it around harm reduction in some way or whatever other term um, is appropriate. But it does seem like even with the syringe um, services commission, you know, this is really getting more broad. And as we're looking at fentanyl with it not being something that's used intravenously and it's more used in other ways, how we can frame, you know, the services we provide around really trying to reduce um, bloodborne pathogens, reduce um, drug use in our community. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was that it really sounds like we need to start moving forward with a pretty strong campaign on um, educating people on the dangers of fentanyl use. And so to the extent that there's grants available to um, work on that, or if there's ways that we can work with you all to put on community forums or work with our schools. Um, I know that when we had a meeting in Live Oak recently, um, Supervisor Koenig and I, there was a, um, a, an individual there whose child is um, addicted to fentanyl and they were really expressing, you know, what are we doing in the schools? How are we getting information out? And so, to the extent that we can really try to start getting ahead of this issue um, or actually play catch up since it's in the community, I think would really be helpful. And um, and that concludes my comments. So, 
All right, I'd like to get to that. Let's be quick because we're 30 minutes late on a scheduled item. But go ahead, Supervisor Hernandez. And at some point, you know, no schedule, no timeline, but I would like to see, you know, my supervisor's office kind of served as the, the, the shelter during COVID, the winter, during the winters, the floods, to, to shelter the houseless, right? Mm -hmm. And so I got the opportunity to talk to a lot of people, a lot of young people too. And I realized that a lot of them talked to me about methamphetamines. And I think that if we can bring up that issue and have a discussion about South County and some of the issues that we have there, because it's been a really quiet problem. And I mean, quiet amongst families, family members, and also quiet amongst service providers. So uh, at some point, if we can meet up about that offline and have a discussion about that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We could have a roll call, please. Absolutely. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. That item passes unanimously with the additional direction. Thank you for the presentation.